Well, we didn't do bad, did we? Not bad at all. Sometimes, you know, the brethren have so much to do on Monday, they can't make it to a Monday night meeting. Looks like you did pretty well. Thank you for being here. We appreciate those of you who are visiting with us for coming and supporting this work, encouraging this work. One of the things we need to be doing is being about the Lord's work. Jesus went to a temple when he was 12 years old. And there he addressed the elite teachers of his day. Mom and dad finally found him, at least stepdad. What are you doing here? Well, you ought to know that I must be about my father's business. And that's one of the things that we need to do while we live on this earth. In the Sermon on the Mount, we are told that we need to be lights, the light of the world. We are told that we need to be salt, the salt of the earth. Perhaps sometimes we fall a little short. We need to say, God, forgive me. Let me be a brighter light. Let me get the salt out of the shaker and shake it a little more. Put some taste in the world for Christianity. Show some light in the world to those who are in darkness, those who are in sin. Maybe we need to do that. We call this an eye with which we see. An ear we use to hear. A nose we use for smelling. A tongue we use for tasting. And hands and feet and toes that we use for feeling, touch. When you're in school, elementary school, someone would say, now that's the five senses. And then after you have probably graduated from that school, middle school, high school, you may get in some mm, higher learning, they say. And you may discuss, now, which of the five senses is most important? And usually the summation comes down to this. Which of the five senses would you dread losing the most? Would it be the ear, the hearing, the eye, the seeing, the nose, the smelling? Understand some folks lost the smell with a pandemic. I wonder if they ever got it back, I don't know. Would it be the taste? Would you hate to lose that more than anything else? Or would it be the touch? And when surveyed, folks like me and you will come to this conclusion. 70% of us will say, I think I would dread losing my sight more than anything else. 70%. Now let me tell all of us here, all of us will probably, at least 95% of us, will lose one of those five senses before we die. 95%. It might, huh? You might be able to not smell anything or taste. It may be sight. It may be hearing. It could be either, but 95% of us will do that. But still, 70% of us would say, I'd rather preserve my sight. My sight. Well, I think I would have the tendency to, to agree with that. Now, what about if you voluntarily destroyed your sight? If you just decided, I'm going to destroy my sight, I'm going to do away with my... We'd say, well, that person is not thinking right. Something's wrong with them. You know, take a acid and put it in your eyes, or take a sharp object and destroy your sight. Something's wrong with that person. And yet, in this country, and in the countries of the world, more people 
are destroying their spiritual sight than anything else. They are voluntarily destroying their spiritual sight. Not their physical, but their spiritual sight. I'd like to read a passage from Matthew chapter 13. If you have your testaments, turn there. And we want to read a few verses, and of course, this is a quotation coming out of Isaiah the prophet. But when you turn to the 13th chapter, drop down about verse 10, and what I want you to notice is this conversation about sight, about eyes, about seeing. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore, speak unto them in parables because, are you watching? Are you listening? They seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, saith, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear did you note in that reading some people could not see Jesus some people could not see God's plan for them. And he says the reason, they closed their eyes. They voluntarily shut their eyes so they couldn't see Jesus. They could not see the Messiah. They could not see God's plan for their salvation. They destroyed their spiritual sense of seeing. We say, that's sad. Almost everyone here has some kind of sight problem, eye problem. Did anyone today have a, an appointment with an optometrist, an ophthalmologist, anybody here? There's one. That's all I see right now. One did. Have any of you an appointment later this week? Next month? <laughs> All of us, probably on a regular basis, we go for an eye exam, don't we? And hopefully they don't say, well, you've got glaucoma. Or you've got macular degeneration. I'm probably naming some of the things that you have. Or, well, you've got to get those cataracts removed. You ever heard anything like that? Well, certainly we've heard that because we get eye exams. I hope that none of you heard, well, you have a tumor behind your eye that's affecting your vision, but that can happen. Some individuals are even told things like, well, uh, you know, when you stuck your finger in your eye the other day, you injured your eye. Or when you got that speck, little speck of something in your eye, did you ever have to go to a doctor and get it out because it hurt so terribly? Just that little, and when he took it out, he, oh, I finally got it. Now if it's a piece of steel in your eye, he'll probably use some kind of a magnet to try to pull that out. And when he shows it to you, you think, did that little thing hurt me that much? And it absolutely did. But we're so thankful that that old eye doctor got us straightened out. Got us where we could see. Where we had now 
corrective lens so that we could see, where we received some medication so that it would reduce the pressure in our eyes. All these kind of things. We're so, so thankful for physical eyesight, aren't we? Have you ever heard Jesus referred to as the great physician? The great physician? Let me tell you something. He can work on that spiritual myopia. He can work on the spiritual ailment of the eye if we'll allow him to do it. But what if you had that piece of straw, of wood, of steel in your eye and you refuse to go? The steel will just keep working more and more and more in. The other will irritate and irritate to the point you can't open your eye. You'll say, I'm going to have to put a bandage over my eye. I'm going to have to black that eye out. It's hurting. Become infected. Get worse and worse and worse. But no, we run as soon as we can to that physician. And we need to run as soon as we can to the almighty physician, Jesus Christ, when we discover that what we have is spiritual blindness. We can't see Jesus. We can't see God. We can't see why he wants us to do certain things in his word. We just can't understand that. See, spiritual blindness has always been true. You go back to Isaiah and Jeremiah, especially Jeremiah, Jeremiah the fifth chapter, you can find. He refers to the fact they have eyes, but they can't see. Terrible condition. You See the Apostle Paul as he's writing to the Ephesian people in the fourth chapter, and he talks about the fact they can't see. You come to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, come to that third chapter, the seventh church of the seven churches of Asia. We know it as the church of Laodicea. Most of the time we know it as the church that was neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm. But what does he say about them? You need to go buy some eye salve because you're blind and cannot see. You need to get your correction on the way right now. You can't see. Why is it? Why is it that a number of people are not here tonight? In fact, hundreds are not here tonight. Thousands, millions are not here. Why is that? You have to say, well, they can't see. They can't see what I see. Have you ever said concerning someone that maybe didn't respond to the gospel, why can't they, why can't they respond? Why don't they respond? And the answer is, they can't see. They don't see what you see. It's not affecting them the way that it's affecting you. They need eye salve. They need healing in their eye. So it's, it's always been a problem. Here's the thing. My friends, we don't want it to be our problem. If it's our problem, we're going to miss out on heaven. If we can't see Jesus, if we can't see the plan of salvation, if we can't see the church, if we can't see living for God, a godly life, we're going to miss out on heaven because we didn't see the prerequisites the things necessary to being in heaven. Have you ever heard the expression or used the expression like water on a duck's back? It just runs off. It just runs, doesn't affect the duck. It just runs off. And sometimes the gospel can be preached time after time after time to individuals and they never respond, they never change their life, they never make any alterations at all in their life, and you ask the question, why is this? They can't see it. They can't see it. As the scripture says, Jesus is saying, there are people who have ears, but they can't hear. They have eyes, but they can't see. Now you know who's in the business of going around blinding people? Satan. That's his business. He's very good at his business, and he goes around and blinds individuals so they cannot see the spiritual conclusions of their life. 
so now let's come back and ask the question. Why is it some people do not respond to Jesus Christ, do not want to believe in Jesus Christ, do not want to believe in God, do not want to prepare for the eternity? Why is that? And it's because Satan is doing a very good job. Very good job of blinding the eyes of folks, of putting folks in darkness and making them like the darkness rather than seeing the light that opens their eyes to the truth, the understanding of what God would have them to understand. You know, if you can't see Jesus, then you can't see the cross. And if you can't see the cross, you can't see the blood. And if you can't see the blood, you can't see the, uh, the forgiveness that comes through the blood. You just can't see it. Why should I obey the gospel? Why should I change my life? I can't see it. So once again, I come back and say, there are hundreds, thousands, millions, and billions of people on the face of this earth, even this day, who are spiritually blind. And Satan is rejoicing because of that. There's an account given in 2 Kings, the 6th chapter. And it was during the day of Elisha the prophet. And the nation of Israel was being invaded by the king of Syria. And the king of Syria surrounds Elisha and Israel. And Elisha's servant gets really nervous about it. We're going to die. We're going to die. And Elisha says, no, we're not going to die. And in the, the, uh, second cha- uh, the sixth chapter there of 2 Kings, Elisha makes a statement. Those that are with us are greater than those that are with them. And Elisha's servant looks around and he just sees he and Elisha and a few others and he's, uh, he couldn't figure that out. And so Elisha prays. Praise, Lord, open his eyes. God, open his eyes that he may see. Open his eyes that he may see. And his eyes were opened, and he saw the army of the Lord surrounding the Syrian army. And, of course, the Syrian army had to be dismissed from their presence and go back home never to fight against Israel again. The Syrian army was not anything. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So sometimes you just need to walk up to someone, I guess, and say, open your eyes that you may see. See the beauty of life. See earth. See the sun, moon, and stars. See the newborn babe. Open your eyes that you may see the little lily pushing through the soil. Open your eyes that you may see the glorious universe that God has created, the earth that he's provided for us. Open your eyes that you may see God. When you're reading in Romans chapter 1, and you're reading about the despicable things that the Gentiles had involved themselves in in the first century, he says in verse 20, they are without excuse for the sins that they're committing, without excuse. They've rejected God, they've turned their back on God, and they are without excuse. Why? Because the invisible, verse 20, the invisible things of God can be clearly seen by the visible, by the things which he hath created. Just open your eyes and see. Open your eyes and see the Bible, the Word of God. In the morning, we're going to spend some time talking about the Bible, the Word of God, and what it says and what it means. But tonight, just open your eyes and read and see what the Word of God says. Some people say, well, I really don't want to put forth that effort myself. And so I'm going to go to someone who claims to be a Bible-believing, Bible-toting, Bible quoting preacher. You need to watch out about that. 
because many false prophets are gone out in the world. You need to try the spirits whether they be of God because there's a lot of false prophets out there. Jesus himself warned there would be false Christ come in the 24th chapter of Matthew. There would be false prophets that would come. So you need to really, really watch relying on any man. Any man. Here's the reason I say that. There are people who claim to be spiritual leaders who are blind themselves. They're blind. They can't see the God of the Bible, the commands of the Bible. And you know, there's a warning given by Jesus himself in the 15th chapter of Matthew at verse 14. In verse 13, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. But you come to verse 14, and he says, there's blind leaders. And let me ask you to help me. If the blind follow the blind, both shall fall into the both shall fall into the ditch. In other words, both of them will be destroyed. That's the reason you need to be very cautious of saying, I get my instruction from this leader over here or that leader over here. Your instruction best come from the Word of God. If what they're teaching is not backed up by the Word of God, don't adhere to it. Cast it away. It's no good. But there are hundreds of thousands, millions of people who are following religious leaders that they believe are God's spokesmen here on this earth. And God never prophesied through them. God never spoke through them, but they've got followers convinced and both will fall into the ditch and that ditch will be the eternal pit known as hell itself. Hell itself. So you don't want to be following a blind leader. Illustration. You have an eye problem, a physical eye problem. You acknowledge you have an eye problem. You look it up on your internet machine and you find an optometrist. And on your internet machine, he has a face page, a big page, a front page that says, I am blind. What are you going to do? You're going to scroll down to another optometrist, right? You're going to find you an optometrist that can see, can look through that machine. You're not going to go to a blind optometrist. And there are a lot of people spiritually that are following blind leaders. And they're going to be destroyed. They'll fall into the ditch. That's a warning that our Lord himself give, gave. When you think about the millions of people who are self-inflicting spiritual blindness on themselves, and they can't see God, and they don't want to see his message, and they don't want to see his son, and they don't want to talk about the gospel, and they don't want to go to a gospel meeting, and they don't want to go to Bible study, and they won't read their Bibles at home. When you think of the millions of people like that are self-inflicting blindness, you have to ask the question, why are you doing that? And I think the major reason is because they don't want to obey they do not want to obey God. They want to listen to themselves, obey themselves, but not God. And so they continue on in their spiritual blindness. There was a man named Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, according to the account given in Acts chapter 9, is on his way to the city of Damascus, there to imprison punish followers of Christ, followers, followers of the way of Jesus Christ. On his way into Damascus, there's a great light that shines. As a result of that, he 
has a communication with the Lord. He's also stricken blind. He is told, go into the city of Damascus, go to the street called Straight, and stay there. He's blind, so he has to have some of his comrades leading men to the city. Have you ever heard the sermon, What the Blind Man Saw? For three days and three nights he was praying, blind. What did he see? He saw that his idea about Jesus Christ was wrong. He saw that his Judaism was wrong, his religion was wrong. He saw that his mama and daddy were wrong. He saw that his trip up to Damascus was for the wrong purpose. He saw that his past was terrible. He shouldn't have done what he did in the past. He saw all these things were wrong. What do you think a man that sees everything in his life as being wrong ought to do? What do you think he ought to do? Continue down the same path? Or alter his path? Had he continued down the same path, he would have been a fool. But he was wise enough to know I'm on the wrong path. And do you know what happened? When a man named Ananias came to him and in that account, Ananias was a man that was a little bit nervous, had trepidation about going to see this one because he had heard what he had done in his life about persecuting the church and he was a Christian. But he went to him, laid his hands on him, and it said that his eyes were cleared up because it was like scales fell from his eyes fell from his eyes, and he could see. And once he had his eyes opened, and Ananias looked at him and said, and now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? He didn't say, well, I need to go talk to mama and dad about that. I need to go talk to my rabbi about that. I need to check if I really want to do that. He said, okay, we'll get that done. And he was baptized when he got his eyes open. But as long as he was spiritually blind, couldn't see Jesus. He was opposed to Christianity. He was opposed to God. He was opposed to God's plan. Sometimes, you know, we need the scales to fall from our eyes. I'd like for you to turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Let's read an account. This account pretty well demonstrates how much an individual would desire, how far they would go in their desire to be able to see. I'm in the 18th chapter of Luke, down toward the end of this chapter, beginning at verse number 35, it says concerning Jesus, it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man, okay, we've been talking about seeing and not seeing tonight. There is a blind man can't see. Sat by the wayside begging. Well, he's a pitiful man, isn't he? He has to beg for a living because he can't be out and work a job like an ordinary person could. And so here he is sitting by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. In other words, he heard some noise, some footsteps, some noise going by. And he said, what, what, what is this? What's going on here? Well, he couldn't see, so he had to ask. And they told him, others said, that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now let me tell you something. He hadn't just been sitting by the road asking for alms. He'd also been listening. He had heard about Jesus Christ. He had heard of the miracles that Jesus had done. This man had been paying attention. He was physically blind, but he was paying attention to the great messenger from heaven. He had never met him, but he had heard about him. Cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on And they which went before rebuked him. Some of Jesus' own disciples said, you be quiet. 
You're just a beggar by the side of the road. You're just an old blind man. Be quiet. They rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But, <laughs> you know, some people you can't tell anything. But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't allow somebody to get in his way. I assume that he had tried physicians. I'm assuming that he had tried old wives' fables and old mixtures, but it, nothing had given him sight. So he said, you be quiet. I'm going to talk to Jesus. You quit telling me to not speak up. I'm going to respond to Jesus. He'll respond to me. You disciples, be quiet. They told him to be quiet. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. How do you think that made the other disciples feel that told this man, you be quiet? Now Jesus is rebuking the very ones that told that man to be quiet. You come here, he says. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Why did he say that? He had heard stories, accounts of Jesus restoring other folks' sight, of healing withered arms, of even raising... He had heard these accounts. He said, Jesus, you're my only hope. Help me to receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Let me tell you something, my friend. When you discover in your life that you've lived a life of spiritual blindness, and you're in the gutter, and you're only looking up because you're down as low as you can go, and you're looking up, you can see the heaven above. But you can also, in your mind's eye, see the supreme being of the universe who created all that. The Lord Jesus Christ, His only Son. You can open your eyes and you can cry out, I need my sight. I need my spiritual sight. I need to receive understanding so that I can be converted. I need to receive the knowledge that God will give me through His Word so that I can do what the Lord wants me to do. You can come out of that spiritual blindness into a life of being a sighted person. It continues on in this account, but I want us to do something else. I want us to go to the next chapter. And I'm going to read an account of a man that would seem to go through embarrassment, go through whatever he has to go through in order to see Jesus. Here it says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Now you know right now that Rich people don't need anything else, do they? I mean, they got their money. They can buy the lawyers they want. They can talk to the bankers they want. They got money. They're rich. You know that. They're tempted with many things. He was rich, it says. And he sought to see Jesus. Whoa. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. And could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was to pass it. Uh, <laughs> a rich man climbing in a tree. That really doesn't play real well in my head. That says something's wrong there. A rich man climbing in a tree. Maybe a rich man having four or five men to build him some kind of a stairway up to an exalted throne or something, but climbing in a tree. Huh. And he said the purpose, the only purpose that he had for doing this was not to be seen of men, 
Not to show how rich he was, get up there and throw out $20 bills or something like that. The only purpose was to see Jesus. And he said the crowd was so big around him and he was so short that he couldn't, so he climbed a, a tree. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and Jesus, now he was wanting to see Jesus, but here it says, Jesus saw him. And here's what he said to him. Have you ever wondered about this? How did Jesus know this man? Ever wondered about that? You see what he said? He said, Zacchaeus. He knew the man. Now, did he know his, the man because he was the son of God and knew all things? Knew what was in every man's heart? Or did he actually have an acquaintance with the man? Well, we're not told. But he says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Boy, aren't you glad that Jesus was glad to come into your presence when you were a sinner? Aren't you thrilled about that? Take you by the hand and say, let's go the right way, my friend. He was a sinner, but there was Jesus. Why were you there? Well, I haven't got to that verse, so I'm not going to tell you what it says, but we'll get to it. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. And here's the verse. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's to give sight. He's the great healer. He's the great physician for individuals like Bartimaeus, both physically and spiritually. He gave sight spiritually to Zacchaeus, the great healer, Jesus Christ. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, we are to, in verse 1, we are to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us and run with patience the race that's set before us. But when you run your race, you have to have your eyes on something. It has to be a goal. And so verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our salvation, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. We need to be able to see Jesus. We need to be able to see the cross of Jesus Christ. In order to do that, we've got to get our eyes off of this world. Quit loving this world and the things that are in the world. Put our eyes on spiritual things. Become spiritually minded rather than carnally minded individuals. We need to do that. When Peter was writing, you remember on one occasion, Peter took his eyes off Jesus and actually cursed and said, I don't even know the man. You remember on another occasion, Peter took his eyes off Jesus and started going down and had to call out for the Lord to rescue him from the waters. You recall that? Well, it's a dangerous thing to take your eyes off Jesus. That's the reason we're always looking to Jesus. But when the Apostle Peter that had in his life taken his eyes off of Jesus Christ, put them back on and died a martyr's death for the cause of Christ. When he wrote 2 Peter, he said, Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you should neither barren, be barren nor unfruitful in the work of the Lord. Listen, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. Is blind and cannot see afar off. Let me tell you something. Peter, on occasions, had been blind. But when he got his spiritual sight restored, ultimately he never took his eyes off the Lord again. See, sometimes Christians become Christians and then six months later they're looking at something else. Six years later they're looking at something else rather than Jesus Christ. 
And the brethren say, where did they go? What happened to them? Well, Satan got a hold of them and blinded their eyes again. That's what he did. He's good at it. I've already told you that. And they may go in that condition for months before they get their spiritual sight back. It may be for years before they, it may be for decades before they get their spiritual sight back. I don't know about your condition tonight. Maybe you've turned your eye away from Jesus rather than looking to Jesus and you've walked away for a few months. You've walked away for a few years. You've walked away for a few decades. I know you haven't walked away for a few centuries, but if we would live long enough, some people would. But I'm telling you, my friends tonight, if you have, turn back around. Take a look at Jesus Christ. Get over that spiritual blindness and see the Lord. See God. See His commands. Obey His commands. And ultimately, we'll see that glorious throne God sitting on the throne, His angels surrounding that throne, and we'll be able to surround that throne and worship God eternally, ultimately, if we opened our eyes and see. I hope tonight that if you have been blinded, or you are blind, that you'll commit yourself to open your eyes spiritually to the truth of God's Word. Start studying it, reading it, and though your sins be as crimson, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like scarlet, they shall be as wool. But you must study God's Word. Learn it and follow it. And if we can help you tonight in obeying your Lord in baptism, praying on your behalf, praying for a need in your spiritual life, we'd be happy to do so. If you'll let us know, let us know tonight, even as we stand and as we sing.